Hello, I'm Joshua, and I'm an INTP, and first and foremost, I would like to say thank you for viewing this video, and subsequently visiting my, visiting my channel. Um, the topic of this video is going to be on the paradox of INFJs, a revisit, because it's been a motivation of mine for a very long time to delete that video, um, but I haven't because I know people... Um, enjoy it to a certain extent, but the kind of misrepresentation of what I was honestly trying to communicate in that video has um, greatly annoyed me. Um, I take it to be my inability to communicate um, lucidly or effectively on an idea. The first thing I would like to say to sort of set the groundwork for how it is I'm actually treating personality types and that video, I was not speaking about INFJs as you interact with them necessarily. I was not talking about them as what I call relational beings, which NFs are fundamentally relationally orientated in the world. I understand this, and I, know, I think I know this better than most people. They find most of the travesties and pangs of their existence due to the lack of relational quality that they find in life. People aren't good in a common complaint possibly by an NF is people don't understand them, people aren't sympathetic enough, people aren't reasonable enough, people aren't good enough in the sense that they're not honest enough or they're not loyal enough as friends, they're not caring enough, they're not concerned enough, they're not kind enough. They have these complaints because they're relational beings and they care more so to be related to another person probably more than they care about anything else in life. That to them is the point of existing fundamentally. And I understand this, but the thing I was trying to elucidate is that there is something else about that nature that shows up in a particular way with an INFJ that is rather surprising because of their tendency to be social agents. They're, it's a lot like an ENFJ, but even with an ENFJ, they're, it's not the same. Well, yeah, ENFJs have some of these same qualities to them because they're dominant extroverted feelers and they care to be social agents. And what I mean, what I mean by social agents is that they would like to be able to influence groups of people in sort of the history of the lines of cause and effect by human and social activity. That's how they're orientated towards the world. That's how they're, that's what they're directed towards to see and to view. They even do it with their own cost-benefit analyses of their actions as individuals because the first thing they want to think about and they want to know is what is it that they're, how is it, how is what they're doing received by other people and how is what they're, how is what they're doing, how would what they're doing be received by um, a group, a larger group of people on um, a, 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 a mass scale. If you read something an INFJ writes, they write it from on a point of appeal to others. They typically write something to be, or they speak in a s sense of rhetoric and persuasion of appeal because that's the way that they're, orient they're orientated. That's how they are to the world because of their extroverted feeling. Now, the thing I say is that they're principalist. They have their ideas and their ideals about how things ought to be. And they know what they want and what they believe as individuals. Even if you don't know that, they know it and they, they have no problem with keeping those things to themselves and um, shedding those um, layers of skin for the sake of another person or donning a different guise and appearance for the sake of equanimity or harmony. But don't let that fool you into thinking that the INFJ does not have these very real epitaphs or structures in them that are very much almost 
because they have polar introverted feeling, it's very much like an INFP where they have an ontological metaphysical system a priori comprise it's just it's in there and it's existing in them and motivating them to move in the world and act on it in a certain way and they're looking out into the world and looking at people in it and they're concerned with how people are interacting with one another and they're concerned about how they're relating to people in the world and they care to get this right like they have a sense of uh, morality and ethics that I don't think that most people understand like in apps in general they care to get how to live right and so an INFJ is going to be really concerned with this uh, from a theoretical standpoint like just from a very larger broader philosophical standpoint and they're really going to look to take to task the problems of mankind that like I kid you not they're going to they may not be that way for all of their life but every INFJ probably goes through a savior phase and has this idea of um, bringing balance or bringing harmony bringing peace bringing something to mankind alleviating the infirmities and the sufferings of the world it's just that they at the same time they're able to know what it is other people feel and what they think and they're pragmatists fundamentally as moral agents and they tend to believe fundamentally deep down that all people are the same but they also cannot help but to see that there are differences in people that lead to different causal relational strands out in society are they um, uh, are they um, uh, elitist not necessarily but they damn sure understand and recognize um, hierarchies and chains of competence because they certainly see this that not all people think the same way and not all issues are treated correctly to their estimation sorry I'm on a trail not all um, issues are treated correctly to their estimation um, and um, uh, process of reasoning in such a way that they're going to have the greatest net benefits that they could have towards the broader ethos of whatever community that they're a part of and you better believe that they're fundamentally um, concerned with that and they're more concerned with the harmony of the situation than they are necessarily the um, uh, need for any one individual or any one person to feel comfortable in um, their expression like that's that's a that's a thing with them and they will overlook because they do it with themselves they overlook the individual concern for the greater concern and they think that usually like I mean this like an INFJ is never gonna think that universal education is about well, maybe, I can't say never, but it's unlikely that an INFJ is going to think that universal education is a bad idea. Um, but I think, fundamentally, that universal education is leads has its own issues and its own problems. Like, it really does. Um, and they'll think that maybe you should, um, uh, they'll think that maybe you should um, revamp the educational system or um, uh, reform it. But they're not going to think that you should disband it completely um, because they think that the more people that there are in the world acting and living a certain way under a given, um, under a common ideal goal and ethos is the best way to be. Um, they will think that, yes, of course you should try and help the most people that you can, but they're also going to think that you put the most competent people up top in order to ensure these changes are things that um, can be seen through. I mean, they're trying to make it so that the things that they act, they work and act towards in the world are truly instantiated there for the benefit of others. 
but I don't think that people necessarily understand nor realize what that means um, from a broader political perspective because oftentimes they find themselves to be pretty damn totalitarian leaning in nature like it's not and I don't, when I say that they're fundamentally totalitarian I don't mean like necessarily as people that they want to be dictators but they're um, <clears throat> they're fundamentally in the sense that they're they believe communally. They have an ethos of communal existence. They just have an item or an aspect pervading their nature of communal existence. So it doesn't mean that they're communists, but if you um, let them sort of engineer the world as they see fit, you would find that a lot of things disappear for simplicity and utility's sake, but also in the sense that they want to make it easiest for people to work with one another they want to make it easiest for people to speak with one another they want to make it easiest for people to um, negotiate with one another and in some ways making those things easier means dissolving the differences between peoples and groups and they're really good at bringing opposing forces together and synthesizing them to some new agent and some new whole particularly in their ideation they're fucking brilliant at dealing with paradoxes and things like that but the problem is when that when you put that on a, a broader uh, social sphere that usually leads to totalitarianism that usually leads to some kind of overarching and pervading dominance of an idea an aspect or any regime because even if an INFJ is not necessarily politically totalitarian and they're orient they're they're definitely philosophically that way because the INFJ is a principalist. They want to find some sort of principle or idea that is true or that that's the most valuable in all cases, in all scenarios for existence. Like it has to necessarily be valuable. It can't be some, they don't want the value to be something predicated on their individual interest or their whims or fancies. Or their imaginings they they are not for that because they're introverted thinkers so they want some principle or some ideation concept or ideal to base the whole precipice of every kind of ontological moral or epistemological system that they come up with I mean they're like that it's like for Plato's good you know it's like it doesn't really it doesn't really matter the type they're gonna find something for um, and Martin Luther King wasn't an um, uh, INFJ but he certainly had the TIFE bent um, and the um, introverted intuitive um, uh, synthes synthesizing of uh, archetypal expressions and um, uh, maxims to govern existence and to explain natures of reality and to live by that I mean he had that and for him it was the higher law the it's like it, it's good the higher law the self the or individuation or actualization whether you're young or Maslow they're looking for things to sort of pin in the system and codify all other things around them and interpret most of the world through a singular vantage point and lens which makes sense to a certain degree because it makes the world it gives you an access to insight and power over your observations over time like to synthesize observations over time is a very very useful thing um, it leads to great um, innovation in terms of uh, any kind of idea any kind of realm of ideation and it also makes it such that you can be a fairly well or a fairly lucid communicator because if you can truncate and uh, distill all information down to these fundamental principles and hand those things out to people, it's really easier for them to pick up on those things and to use those things rather than some other rather much more complicated, um, uh, obtuse, like, thing they, they're not gonna you know it makes it makes those things easier but the problem is it's just that that's not necessarily how um, uh, self-organizing systems operate because they're largely theoretical and 
some respects. It all happens in within them in um, a vacuum to a certain extent. And they... But they don't. Like, that's the thing. They don't have any problem. Jesus, there's all these flies. They don't have any... They don't necessarily have a problem with um, seeing these things through. And they don't necessarily... They, they, In fact, it's not that they don't have necessarily have a problem. They want to see a lot of their ideas through. They don't just have ideas to have in people. They have their ideas so that they can act with those ideas in the world. That's legitimately what they have those ideas for. They're not there just to be cute little um, knickknacks on the wall of their... Um, uh, intellectual um hall of fame like that's not that's not the case for an infj that's not the case for any nf they legitimately want to act the things out that they know and that they believe like that's the whole point for point to them because they're not just philosophers they're not just theorists they're ethics they're ethicists they care about ethics they care about morality like they definitely care about reason they definitely care about um uh, logic they care about all those things but they care about all those things as it pertains to ethics and morality. Like, if it's not for the ethics and morality, if it didn't make it such that it made it easier for people to live, or made it so that it was um, uh, more likely for us to achieve our goals and things like that in terms of um, broader communities and things, they wouldn't care. They would not give two shits. I mean, they, they're like that because they're, they're pragmatists to a certain extent. And, I, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. But the mere fact is, is that the um, uh, very um, aspect of their nature, though they can live and let live, is something that seeks to impose a singularity or a monism, a single I idea or concept. They want something to be the... I mean, I'm not kidding. Like, it's like, well, obviously I'm not kidding, but I don't know if people can understand how real it is, man. It's not. It's not like... Or, or in the sense that I don't think that I'm imagining this. Like, I get it from reading other INFJs. Um, uh, Plato definitely bought into the idea of the Philosopher King, and he predicated his whole um, uh, republic on it. And it was a totalitarian system. Um, Jung, all right, when you talk about Jung and his idea of uh, actualization, Jung re legitimately wanted to revivify what he saw as the... Um, decaying um, structures of a society and bring the um, uh, and bring back the boom to the kingdom in a sense like the world once this is young guy this is Jung's idea the world was once populated and inhabited by spirits and other numinous aspects of existence things that are anthropomorphically salient to human existence and we saw the gods and the mythos and the heavens and in nature. But when we rationalized the world, those things were stripped from the world and inverted themselves back into uh, mankind. But they were um, continually poured out and re-represented in narrative and art and story representation, statues and all sorts of things like that. And Jung saw that as the archetype being reintroduced um, to the world and giving solace and um, uh, meaning to human existence because he saw people being things that were fundamentally predicated on meaning, which he got from Nietzsche, which, I'm not, which isn't wrong. I'm not saying that that's wrong, but I'm just saying where the connection is. So I'm saying that that's a good idea. But his idea for how to make it... His idea of how of how to deal with that was that you revivify the individual such that you get all of the individuals to be, or you individuate them, you actualize them to the extent that the unconscious starts being dawned out into the world and starts being expressed in the world again. That the world would be repopulated with the shamanic aspects and that the mythos would find a way to... Um, sort of do a um, uh, Hegelian dialectic with the um, uh, rational and not only technology and science um, uh, existed in the world, but that technology and science existed in the world while it was also inhabited with spirits, the numinox, and the archetypal aspects of reality. And I'm not kidding, that's what he was up to. He legitimately wanted to bring chaos and disorder back into the world as he saw it, like the good kind of chaos and things. 
But you don't really know what's in the... Well, I'm just saying, like, if you knew what Young was up to, you'd think, like, holy shit, that's dangerous. Like, and, it, and kind of, it, it is. It, it certainly is. And, um, oh, wait. Well, it is. Like, it, it just really... it that That's kind of out there. I mean, like, Young was brilliant, but Young was out there, man. Like, he was really, really out there. And um, it's the same thing with uh, Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King legitimately believed that if every person knew, could um, understand the higher law, then all systems of government and um, uh, all forms of corruption would disappear if we all abided by the higher law. Which I think King meant with the higher law is, it's definitely a Christian... Um, uh, It's definitely judeo Christian um, influence, but it, that's not necessarily the case, because Jung was also an admirer of Thoreau, and I mean Thoreau was a transcendentalist. Like he wasn't he was kind of like an existentialist. He was kind of like a Christian, but Thoreau was a whole host of things. He was a lot like Emerson, and the higher law that King is talking about is intelligible through Christian language, but is probably more observable. And what Thoreau meant in his work, uh, civil disobedience, and what um, some and certain things that Emerson uh, spoke about of man's place in nature and the ordering in natural, like certain just different kind of transcendental ideas, like that aren't really specifically relevant but the point i'm trying to make is that there's this consistent strand like there's this consistent trend with them and their ideas with them and their ideas don't stay in them they and they act them out into the world and they legitimately go on gospels like they legitimately come up with their gospel they put it in their backpack and they begin to walk out in the world and act on it and speak it to people and try to get them to see. Sam Harris is another great example. Like, his idea about well-being and things. I mean, like, they're, that's what they do. Like, that's what they fundamentally do. And even if they're democratic, even if they're not, like, communistic, they're totalitarian. Like, they're very totalitarian in their nature. And they're not going to think that they're that way. And they're not going to think that there's anything wrong with it. Because it's like, for it, for them, it's like a fish being in water. It's like, they wouldn't be able to see it in the first place. Because they live in the thing. Like, you're not honestly, they're, honest, they're not honestly going to know. But I'm telling you, as an outside observer, just somebody who watches them, they're fundamentally totalitarian. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying it's surprising. It's very, very surprising. Because it's, you know, there's too many ways for that to go wrong. And there's too many ways that that very aspect of their nature flies in the face of, in a very, like, in a very logical manner, flies in the face of the things that they prize and that they value. Because they care about relationships and they care about human well-being. Uh, very, very, very much so. But at the same time, they think that rules, they, they really think that rules, principles, and concepts, or um, higher ideological forces, or highest ideals, should be at the center of man's affairs, and they should direct things. If these things, if everybody um, subscribed or practiced this thing or like I'm telling you if you ever ever have an INFJ pitch something to you they're gonna talk they're gonna talk to you about something locally how something's locally beneficial and then move to the individual beneficial piece but they usually start with the local like they usually start with the local if people did this and I mean that's not always the case like that's not always the case they, they definitely know how they definitely know how to talk to an individual but essentially they even when they're talking to an individual they're selling you something that they think is true. Not for you necessarily, but in general. It applies to you specifically, but it's true generally. And they want that they want that thing instantiated in the world. And I mean like it's not like they're all gonna stop at nothing to see that thing instantiated on the world. They're not villains or anything like that. No most INFJs, I mean they're not like they're not all Hitler or anything like that. I mean but it's just to say that it's surprising. 
and I mean, maybe how, maybe a way for you to understand this um, on an individual level, try to argue with an INFJ about something and see how stubborn they are. And it's not, they're not being stubborn because they think that they just don't like to change their mind. Like, they're human. Yeah, they're human, and they can, they can certainly have their, um, uh, they can certainly have their um, frailties and their um, limitations, but they're not holding steadfast to that thing because they just want to be difficult. They're holding steadfast to that thing because they think it's the way, or it is a part of the answer. They think that it is something significant and valuable, and they're not going to let you tarnish that thing, and they're not just going to let you take it away from them. They're not going to do that. They're not. And they would much rather have it such that they are alone than to give up what they know to be the um, uh, truth or the, th the very things that could save mankind. If just everybody listened or if everybody just did or just everybody acted or if everybody just did this thing. I mean, Dostoevsky's like that. They're all like that, man. Like, but it's, it's not to say that they're wrong always or anything like that. It's just to say that it's freaking surprising. And another thing that's surprising about them in terms of their paradox is that, yeah, they, INFJs care about other people, but they don't care about people the way you think that they care about them. They don't, necessarily. It's like, do they do... And I don't mean to say that they're not... Because they're agreeable. So this is the best way to say it. INFJs are agreeable. Just because somebody's agreeable does not mean that they necessarily like you. That's the best way to say it. Just because somebody is willing to be compassionate, just because somebody is willing to um, be empathetic, does not mean that they think that you're, they're your, you're their friend. Or does not mean that they think that um, you're the greatest thing since sliced bread. Because they honestly feel that way about all people. Like, it's not, there's nothing in particular to, there's nothing in particular to you. Like, it's, and if there is something particular to you, you earn it over time. But it's not, just because an INFJ is behaving a certain way with you, does not mean that they feel a certain way about you. Like, that's honestly what I was trying to explicate. And it's not that they're, it's not that they dislike you. It's just mostly that they're indifferent towards you as an individual, but mostly concerned with your well-being as a human being overall. That's it. Like, that's what they... That's that's how that's how they are. There's nothing necessarily malevolent about that. There's nothing necessarily wrong about that. But you have to. But maybe an INFJ, because uh, there is uh, quite a few INFJs are offended by this. But maybe you as an INFJ can understand that people, the impression that that gives to other people, is that you, you do care about them. You do care about them, but you don't care about them like they think you care about them, or at least like they can think that you care about them. That's the only thing that I was trying. That's the only thing that I was trying to explicate, because to an outside observer, maybe not to the INFJ, because they're used to them. None of these things seem surprising, and none of these things seem paradoxical, because they surprise the shit out of me. Like I swear they do. <laughs> like they, they do, because you don't think that you don't think that an individual could be comprised the way that they are. Like you just really don't think, because. In one in one sense, they are just rational. In another way, they're just rational agents. Like if you ask them why they do something, they'll say because it was the right thing to do, well because it was right or because it made sense. But they don't really deviate from those two things. Or maybe they wanted to or something like that. Maybe they're just kind of whatever. You never know. But if they're really going to justify why they're doing something, they're going to appeal to something that is. Um, that's not, that doesn't show any deference towards anything earthly or anything worldly in the sense of, um, uh, they're just not going to do that, man. They're not like that. And you wouldn't think that because locally they're so effective as um, relational and social agents. But if you start digging down in them to why they're that effective or why they go to the lengths that they go to, or why it's that extreme, or why they care so much, it appeals to nothing that you would have in mind. Nothing at all. Like, probably, probably, I'm not saying always, but it probably would not appeal to anything you would think that it should appeal to. Whether it's for the love of God, whether it's for the highest good, whether it's um, in, re in deference or reverence to the highest, the higher law, whether it's in reference 
or a deference to the numinous or whatever, you would not, you just, you're like, wow, I really wouldn't have guessed that. <laughs> like, that's like, you wouldn't, like, <laughs> at least to me, at least to me, if you're being honest with yourself, like, I think, I think that, because they're self-organizing systems, like, I guess. No, I can't just say that, because maybe that's just something I want to say to explain all things, but, you know, that's what I meant about the paradox of INFJs. And, um, and what I wanted to say at the beginning of that video, it's something to that's to the core of their nature, but does not describe totally who or what they are, because it's just one aspect. I'm just taking one thing and putting it under a microscope. I'm not saying this is who an INFJ is, I'm saying it's what they are. A what is different from a who to me. I mean, and I deal with most types as what. And this is only one part of the what. It's a really goddamn interesting part of the what to me, but it's only a piece. So, yeah, that's the that's a revisit on the paradox of INFJs. And uh, if you don't agree with this one, I don't care. <laughs> like, I really don't care <laughs> at this point. But thank you for watching.